Ready? I am calling this meeting to order. Thank you all for joining us. And I know we've got people out there joining us on Facebook Live. I want to introduce myself. My name is Kiana James, and I am with Friendly Faces Senior Care. We provide caregiving services for seniors. And also, I am on the executive board of the chamber. I'm the VP of this committee, the Business and Entrepreneur Committee. And so we have a special meeting planned for you guys. We know everyone loves to hear about taxes. But before we get to that, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl so she can talk about our safety procedures and conflict of interest. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. Uh, it's always exciting to see what Kiana has uh planned for us and as far as what we can learn to make our businesses stronger and better. As she said, I'm the senior vice president here at the chamber. And I wanna just say, look around your office or wherever you are and make sure you know the safe way out in case something unforeseen happens. As far as conflict of interest, we just want you to um, know in your business, if you are doing something for gain that seems to be a little bit shady, you should go ahead and declare it. So today we learned that you should declare and then you should adhere to those policies. There's one other, but I've already forgotten it. How bad is that? We'll have to catch you up next month. So anyway, I'll turn it over and let somebody else introduce themselves. All righty. And so we have Ms. Tony Vale, who's joining us from the chamber. Would you like to introduce yourself and kind of tell us who you are and what your role is going to be with the chamber? Good morning. Hi, uh, my name is Tony Valle. I am Vice President of Business Retention and Entrepreneurism here at the Chamber. Uh, my role will be to work closely with um, this committee and try, uh, I mean, and um, support what we're already doing and see what other great offerings and how we can support the local small businesses and um, entrepreneurs of, of Pearland, along with uh, work with um, the EDC uh, with the BizConnect and um, the workforce. Good morning. Great. And we are so happy to have you join us. And we know we have people out there watching online. So we definitely want to say thank you and hello. We know in this forum or the way that we're doing this by Zoom and going live on Facebook, we do have people that will watch us later. So big shout out to you guys as well. Okay, so going right along with our agenda, um, what we're going to talk about today is the topic of proactive taxation, and I'm going to be paying close attention. <laughs> All of us love taxes. We know that this is, this is April. We know usually, I guess yesterday would be the day where everyone would go crazy, but apparently there's been some extensions this year due to the COVID pandemic, but we know April is usually the month that a lot of people are thinking about taxes and for business owners, March that is. So usually people don't really get ready for their taxes until the end of the year. I know I do. <laughs> and that's really the wrong way to look at taxation. So whether you're doing it from a personal standpoint or a business, and we're really gonna focus on business, but we can add in some things for personal as well. You really wanna do that at the beginning of the year and you want to plan out your year and you can make adjustments accordingly. And so we've have two experts here with us, Scott and Doug, and we're going to introduce them because we want to talk about some useful tips for business owners and also individuals can learn for personal as well on things we need to do now so that we can set ourselves up for success when it comes to taxation instead of waiting to the end of the year. So first we're gonna start with introductions. I do see that, I don't know if Carol wants to say hi or anything, I do see she's listening in. If so, just let us know. That is our, pres our CEO of the Pearland Chamber who will be unfortunately leaving us in June. But we're going to do some introductions of our panel guests. So I'll start with Scott. If you could tell us who you are, who you work for, 
and kind of a, a bio, short bio about yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Youngblood. Um, I'm a CPA and attorney at law. I have my own uh, office in Paraland, Texas um, on Highway 35. Um, I've been doing a, accounting work, uh, seems like forever now, uh, since the early 80s. Um, and uh, I became a lawyer back in the 90s, wanting to enhance uh, working with businesses on how to set up companies and do um, uh, planning with um, estates, um, you know, when you get older. So uh, I have, I do most, I do a lot of tax returns, we do bookkeeping, and like I said, we do planning for businesses and estates, so, um, and that's probably about it right now. Awesome. And are you a resident? Do you say you're a resident of Pearland? Half the time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Usually on Friday, I'm not here because I'm going to the to where I live the other half of the time. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, thank you. Um, and we want to introduce Doug, who probably doesn't even know what Pearland is, but he's joining <laughs> us from afar. Tell us a little bit about you, Doug. Thanks, Keon. I, I assume uh, Perlin is in uh, Texas. Um, unlike, uh, unlike you guys, I'm in Florida. So um, again, my name is Doug Walters. I am a managing partner of a CPA firm with offices in Bradenton and Sarasota, Florida with a national client base. We're about a 25-member firm. You know, we, we are full service in terms of auditing, outsourcing, accounting, taxation uh, for businesses and, uh, and individuals. And we're also a registered investment advisory firm too. So we help with wealth management, personal financial planning uh, and all of the, those things that go along with it. Awesome, thank you so much. And you do some specializations for healthcare as well. Do you wanna speak on that? Sure, so, yeah, so, so that's really where we, we obtained our national client base. You know, we, we have uh, focused in the healthcare space, we have over 500 clients nationally that we, that we help, uh, probably more than that in the healthcare space now, um, that we do some specialty Medicare cost reporting for, um, helping uh, healthcare companies, uh, you know, not only with their accounting needs, but uh, taxation and, um, um, you know, the specialty work there. So Medicare has a lot of rules and regulations and, and uh, we, we've focused on, on those areas. And then uh, of course, parlayed that into uh, being a full service uh, uh, not, not, not too much, uh, trying not to be all things to everybody, but certainly in the healthcare space, we can, uh, you know, help a, a healthcare company uh, from, you know, help them with all of their taxation and accounting needs. Awesome. Thank you. And I wanted you to mention that because we do have people from our healthcare um, market here in okay. Pearland and Houston, too, that will join or might see this as a replay. So that's very, very important. Okay, so we have about 10, 11 questions that we wanna dive into. And we're gonna get our experts to talk about this lovely subject of taxation that everyone loves and how we can do better with paying Uncle Sam. <laughs> so we're gonna start with our first question and this is just gonna be a general flow. So I'll ask the question, and if anyone wants to volunteer to go first, that's fine. If not, I'll just call on you. And then the other can give your um, expertise or your commentary on that same subject. So we're going to start first with, since we're just talking about tax planning, what does that mean? What exactly is tax planning? And we'll start with Scott. Well, tax planning, um, which, what you want to do, because um, I, a lot, a lot of my clients come to me at the last minute, you know, like you mentioned yesterday was normally the, um, the due, de the, the deadline uh, for us here in Texas, the deadline is June 15. I don't know, I think Florida is, is um, May 15. Um, we, we had that special freeze, so we got a little bit extra time. But usually what happens is people come to my office on April 14th and drop their stuff off. And, and then they wonder what they can do to lower their taxes in, in less than 24 hours. So what we would like to do is we'd like to do some planning on that, uh, preferably more than a day ahead so that we can do things to lower your taxes or defer your taxes, do, do something with your, your taxes um, other than just try to prepare your tax return. Because 
you know, you can go and get your tax return done anywhere, but we'd like to do more than just prepare your tax return. We'd like to do things to, to try to help you uh, lower your tax liability, um, you know, if we, if we can do that. So, uh, Doug, you got anything else to add? Yeah, no, I think you're, you're spot on, Scott. You know, um, it, it's hard to unring the bell, you know, and so, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and like, like your practice, we have the same thing. And in fact, you know, with the extension uh, deadline being extended this year due to COVID, you know, we, what we see is that everybody will come in at the very last minute then. So, so it's, it's kind of like a never ending, um, uh, you know, it's like slow pain, a slow pain all, all year long when they extend the tax deadline, because we're going to, we're going to be working all year long. And, and we're, you know, that's, that's what we signed up for. We're happy to do that. But the point here is everybody or most people will wait to the very last minute to, to gather their data and they're looking over their shoulder to try and figure out what happened last year. And so I think, you know, from a tax planning perspective, what we're trying to do is take a proactive look at opportunities and strategies that can provide a better tax result over time. And if you don't have time to do that, then, then you're not really tax planning. And so um, you've got you've to be ahead of the game and you've got you've to implement some meetings with your CPAs or your accounting people uh, well in advance of the tax deadline. Definitely. And I, I hear that, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking to me. Go ahead. I was going to say Keanu is one of our clients and I'm not talking to you, Keanu. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's so funny um, as business owners, and we'll, we'll get into some of those reasons, but as business owners, we focus on business and we're, we're running a mile um, a minute. And so there's always something going on, but so that's why this is such a very, very important, important topic. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about reactive tax planning and we'll start with you, Doug. What, what does that mean and what, why do we not wanna do that? Sure, so, so um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, we're really focused on businesses here. And, you know, when, when you look at, at, you know, the tax situation, the vast majority of our clients and the vast majority of, of people that are members of the chamber, I'm sure, are passed through businesses. They're the partnerships or sole proprietorships, they're uh, S Corps. And so it really flows through to their personal tax return. So, so personal financial planning and or personal tax planning is very critical uh, because it's ultimately uh, how you're gonna pay the tax. And so being reactive is, is kind of exactly what Scott said. You know, someone shows up at his office and says, how do I you know, uh, reduce my taxes in the next 24 hours? Um, at that point, it's too late. You're, you're trying, to, trying to react to a tax bill uh, that, that, that is tough to, to unring that bell. And so um, I, I think that's what you, when you look at it and say, well, you know, what, what could I have done? Last year, maybe I could have implemented an IRA. Maybe I could have done some tax loss, loss harvesting in our brokerage accounts. Maybe I could have elected S corporation status, for example. Um, that's kind of being reactive and it's too late for last year, but maybe we can implement that moving forward uh, this year. But um, I think you'll be more re reactive to the tax bill at that point. Okay, and Scott, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Doug. Um, I mean, a lot of people just, you know, they, they try to, um, you know, one, one of the things with, with, from a business standpoint, a lot of times what happens is people will come in here in uh, February, March, or April, and they need their entire uh, books for the prior year done before we can even do their tax return. So, so, I mean, one of the, you know, so a lot of times we're just kind of reacting and trying to figure out what happened six, eight months ago and, and, and it can be very difficult. So, um, so that's, that's one of the things. And, and as Doug talked about, you know, you, a lot of people have these flow through entities, either be a partnership S Corp or even a schedule C um, on your tax return. And it impacts your personal tax situation. So you want to make sure that you plan uh, for, for both sides at the same time. So, so a lot of people, I mean, they're, they're trying to react in the last minute. Um, and like Doug said, you know, some of these things that we can do, and we'll talk about coming up here, you know, with IRAs, et cetera, and you can start doing that today for next year. You don't have to wait until April 14th to figure out what it is you need to do. Um, the good thing here in Texas is we have till June now to make those payments. And I think for the rest of the country, it's it's May fifteenth, I believe. Did I did they? I don't remember if they extended all of the payments that are due for other states. Um, but I but in Texas, all your payments are extended to June. 
Right. So what I'm hearing from you guys is basically you all have a high stress job <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because of everybody coming at you at the last minute with all these exuberant needs. <laughs> well, I know you can relate being in healthcare. You, you also have a high stress job. So we, we appreciate Definitely. that. <laughs> Definitely, especially through um, COVID. So let's begin talking about this proactive because we're, we're stressing proactive tax planning. So what is it? And then why should people be in a proactive tax planning mindset? Scott, you want to start? Yeah. Um, what we're doing when we're proactively tax planning, we're, we're, trying, we're trying to look ahead. We're not, we're not trying to deal with last year today at the last minute. So we're trying to plan ahead. We're trying, it's 2021. We should be looking at how we're going to handle 2021 not 2020 right now, especially for, for uh, businesses. And so we're, we're trying to anticipate the future, what it is we need to do, what kind of changes do we anticipate? And in these things, you know, um, you know we, we look at how our accounting, you know, keep our accounting up to date. Um, what, what do we, um, you know, if we have a budget, you know, keep a budget, how are we doing against the budget? So, so these things we wanna do, we wanna do today for today and tomorrow versus um, how a lot of people reactively do it from the past. So, and these things are important because, you know, if you need to hire more personnel, uh, if you want to set up uh, some kind of retirement plan in your business, there's deadlines on getting these things done. And you can't do it on April 14th. You have to do it during the year before, before the, the deadlines, which are usually in October. So, so these are things that you want to do today. Uh, another one is what kind of assets do you purchase? Um, because the one thing I hate to see is if somebody goes and buys an asset January 2nd, when they could have bought it December 31 and gotten the tax write off for that prior year, these are things that you want to plan out ahead. Um, so, so that's, that's what we're trying to do is we're looking ahead, anticipating what we, what we're going to need. And the other thing is making sure that we're making our payments, um, in advance versus from behind and getting hit with penalties. Doug? Yeah, no, you're right, Scott. That's, that's a great point, you know, that the, um, the quarterly tax payments, because so, so often, you know, when we prepare those taxes, we find that uh, they weren't made. Um, maybe the, the, the new business owner wasn't aware of the quarterly tax filing requirement or the, the payment requirement. And, you know, once they have that significant profit that first year, now all of a sudden they've got a penalty because they didn't pay in uh, quarterly. But I think, you know, from our perspective, one of the things that we like to do with clients, you know, and as we end the third quarter, begin the fourth quarter, if we haven't done it already, is to, to sit down and do a tax plan or tax projection. Because at that point, we can say, look, based on your business income uh, up to this point, you know, let's, let's, let's you know, uh, extrapolate that for the, for the remaining quarter and get an estimate of what we think your taxes are going to be um, and get you prepared for that. So it's not a big surprise come tax deadline. And then from there, how do we minimize that tax? You know, um, you know, so so things that you know we typically will talk to people about is you know, look, any revenue you receive if you're a cash basis taxpayer is going to be taxable this year. And so to the extent that you can delay billing, for example, no one likes to hear that, you know, but if you can collect something in January versus December, then that's going to kick that can down the road a little further. Uh, conversely, you know. Um, you know, paying your expenses early. So to the extent that you have expenses related to the following year that you can pay in December, that's going to be, be a tax deduction for the current year. So the IRS allows you to deduct up to 12 months in advance uh, for those early payments. And to the extent the vendor will take those payments, uh, for example, your rent for January, you can pay in December. Uh, and to the extent the landlord will take, take additional rent, uh, you can pay up to, like I said, a year in advance. Um, you know, Scott mentioned implementing a retirement plan, uh, selling securities at a loss. You know, if you have capital gains and you look at your investments, if you have investments and you have some losses, we call it tax loss harvesting, where you can sell some of those losses and offset those capital gains. Um, and then, of course, equipment purchases is another big thing. So to the extent that you've got some cash and, and you can buy some equipment to lower that tax bill, uh, that, those are conversations we have with clients but that's where we get to the point of now we've got some time and these are some things that we can implement before it's too late. You come to, come to your accountant in April 
say, well, these are the things you could have done last year, right? And so uh, at that point, you're being reactive. So that's that's kind of what the difference is be, between uh, proactive and reactive tax planning. Great, that sounds great. So why then, gentlemen, is it important to have a good CPA that is both innovative and thorough? Doug, you wanna start? Sure. Yeah. So, so you know, innovation is very, very important in the accounting world. I mean, look, things are happening quickly, right? And so, you know, we make a, a large investment in our software uh, because we want to be kind of cutting edge there, not only from a growth perspective, but you know, as as tax laws change and and um, you know, the, the code is is already complex enough, we've got to make sure that we we cover all of our bases. And so, um, being innovative certainly helps us to uh, give the best advice to our clientele. And so we do that through software investments um, and continuing education. And I think there was a second part of that, innovative Yeah, and, and thorough and innovative. So. Oh, thorough, yeah, obviously I think, you know, I, I don't know that you can have an accountant that's not thorough at, these, at this point, but um, certainly it's very, very important uh, looking at your overall perspective, perspective. So not only from a business perspective, but a personal perspective. And sometimes we'll see clients where you know, they have one accountant personally and they have maybe a partnership. So they have the partner's accountant doing their tax, their corporate taxes. And so it's very helpful to have uh, both of those responsibilities or both of those jobs under one roof so that that accountant can be thorough in their uh, review of their, their personal situation as well as their business perspective. Okay. And Scott, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, he talked about, uh, the, you know, the tax laws. And the other thing you've got to pay attention to, uh, the CPAs, I mean, I know I do, and I'm sure Doug does, um, especially in uh, an environment uh, like today is, well, what tax laws are going to change? You know, try to stay on top of that. Um, I get, <laughs> it's funny is, you know, the TV says, well, they're thinking about this. And the next day I get a hundred phone calls. Oh, did they change that? Well, no, not yet. But it is, it is important to stay, um, to pay attention and say abreast of what might be changing so that you can make uh, changes um, in, in your tax structure, you know, and, and maybe do things a little bit different. Um, and it all, it all depends. I, I say that all the time um, in taxes, it depends on, on, you know, the situation or what we're going to do, but, but you do need to pay attention to that. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, talk about being thorough is we want to pay attention to what deductions that you have and what are deductible or not deductible. You know, in 2018, uh, I had a lot of clients, you know, who, who have tickets to the football games, you know, the Texans and the, the Astros, and, and now you can't deduct any of that stuff. So that's something, you know, so some people, they don't care, they're still gonna do it. And other people, um, they, they um, you know, they're like, well, if I can't deduct it, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. So these are things that, you know, you have to kind of pay attention to. What, what is it that you do in your, on, on your, through your business that is important for, for you from a tax standpoint. And like Doug said, you know, accountants, we're, we are pretty thorough. We try to go through everything um, and try to make sure that we don't miss anything. And, and that's important. Um, I, get, I get a lot of questions all the time as to what is deductible. I actually send everybody this little sheet I make up, but not everything is deductible for everybody. So that's real important You know what your business is. And that's something that I try to pay attention to is if you're in a certain type of business, make sure that we're capturing the expenses that are allowed to, to you. So, um, and, and, you know, Doug does a lot of healthcare and those are different than, you know, I, you know, a construction business or a restaurant business. So, but, so those are, those are some of the things um, that I've got. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add Scott, you know, I, I appreciate what you're, what you're saying there because, you know, as you were talking about things changing and you see something on TV and then, you know, uh, it changes the next day. It reminded me of the PPP situation, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and at first, you know, the, the PPP loans came out and they were, you know, they were taxable and they were not taxable and they were not taxable, but you couldn't claim the deductions uh, and now you can claim the deductions. And so that thing changed, uh, must've been a dozen times by the time we got it all worked out. So, and it continues to evolve. I mean, the EIDL program is, is another great example of that. So. Yes, and, those, and then this year, the change in the middle of the tax season to make things not taxable for employment purposes. If you had unemployment income, the first 10,200 is suddenly not uh, taxable after I've already done, I don't know how many tax returns. <laughs> and, 
So yeah. then we started putting them aside. People were like, well, why are you waiting? It says, I'm waiting to figure out what they're going to say. I mean, That's I want right. to make sure I have it right before I move forward here. So this year has been a challenge with some of those cha those changes. Um, but you're right, that PPP stuff was, um, it, it, well, it's still challenging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I learned a lot about the government. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know they could just stop midway and just make all kind of changes and then yeah. go backwards. <laughs> like, yeah. what? It's it's been an interesting year for everyone, and so while we want to make sure that we have a good CPA that's both innovative and thorough, I did in my research read how we have to be very very careful if our CPA is too creative, <laughs> that might yeah. get you in trouble. Yeah. I've, I don't know if y'all want to uh, speak on that, but I, I've heard <laughs> stories, which was always a, a fear of mine. So. I've heard stories, so I don't know if y'all want to just kind of touch on being careful about the CPA you have. Yeah, and that's that's a good point, Kiana. Um, I uh, I get a lot of people. I you know I get I do a lot of IRS uh, litigation type work. Um, basically, argue with the IRS on someone's behalf, and sometimes even have to go to go to court. And and a lot of times, what happens is these people will come in and will. I'm being audited on, on ABC or whatever that's going on. And my previous CPA or accountant or whoever it was told me I can deduct all those things. And you can't. I mean, you can't. There's a lot of things you can't do. And so you've got to make sure that you're, I mean, I'll do everything I can to get you the best uh, deductions possible, but there's a legal line. You, you can't cross that line. And, and a lot of people do, and you've got to be very careful about that. You've got to make sure that you're not crossing that line and to doing things that are not legal. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I see a lot are people deducting their mileage to work. You, you can't do that. It's not allowed. Community miles are not deductible. And there's other things that people try to do. So the, um, and you've just got to be careful about that. Another one that's big uh, in businesses for this, you know, for the businesses out there is for who's a contract labor and who's a, who's an employee. And, and there's, the IRS has a test for that. And granted the IRS and I don't always see eye to eye to how, you know, how these things go, but you know, you've got to understand what you're dealing with and, and who, who might or might not be a, a contractor versus who's an employee. You know, some things are pretty cut and dry and other things are not. So you've got to really pay attention to that. And I'm, I'm sure Doug's got some examples too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Scott, you're absolutely right. I, I think, you know, one of the ways to avoid that is to really hire a professional that's licensed, you know, and yes. so sometimes you see some schemes out there, some, some tax law savings, and, and we've seen them uh, time and time again, where a practitioner will end up going to jail for it, uh, and, along with their clients, because they, they've gotten themselves into some trouble. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is, right? And so, Certainly talk to a licensed professional uh, before you, you take advantage of any of those, those things that seem to be you know, too good to be true. Um, so yeah, we, we see that all the time, but um, um, yeah. yeah and, and, and on that point, the one thing people don't always understand is the IRS, yeah, they may put the CPA or the tax preparer in jail, but they come after you for the taxes. Right. And you know, a lot of people come in here. Well, how do I fix this? Well, I, I can't fix it. I mean, um, and the IRS. I mean, I remember talking to an agent one time, and and I said, well, you know, can we at least get the penalties waived? You know, they're going to pay the tax. And the and the she goes and checks. She goes, no, we're not going to waive the penalties because they knew that they were getting a better deal, and they knew something wasn't right, and they did it for three years in a row. So yeah. the IRS is going to draw a line and say, no, you're not going to. You're, you're going to pay us, and that's the end of that. And, and, you know, technically, when you do something like that on your tax return, you are breaking the law, but they're not going to put you in jail. Normally, they're going to put the preparer in jail, but they're going to make you pay the bill and pay all the penalties and interest on it. So you really got to be uh, pay attention. And like Doug said, um, you want to make sure that you have a professional and, and that pays attention to your business. So, yeah, I think, you know, one of the approaches that we have is, you know, if, if you imagine a straight line and, you know, it starts off, you know, black and then it turns gray and then it gets gets to red, you know, and, and so the red is going to get you in trouble. And we, we tell our clients, like, we'll keep you out of the red, 
the gray, you know, there's going to be a lot of gray areas in the tax code. We, we deal with them every single day. And we'll tell you what the, what the uh, opinion that we have is on that particular matter. But we tell clients that'll be your call. So if you want to get aggressive, we're okay with getting into that gray area aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we have a better than not chance of, of winning that. And so that can go either way on, on audit, but, but it's still a good tax position. And then of course, uh, you know, the black is easy. So, you know, I, I think that approach is, is probably, um, you know, something that's well received. Yeah. The test yeah. on that is, is it more likely than not that you would win on, a, on an audit? I agree with Doug on that. Yeah. So, um, that's, that's very interesting. I like that scale of, of how you measure that. And Scott, you mentioned something about as far as deductions, because that's a big question that business owners and individuals always have about what, what can I deduct? Um, and people will try to get creative. Um, you mentioned that there's something that you give out. Is that only to your customers or do you, we always like to give to our panel. So I, I have it, um, I we email it to people. Um, the most important thing that's on it is at the very top. And this comes from a, a Supreme Court case with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, what's deductible for you? It's, it's anything that's ordinary and necessary for, for your business. Um, and, you know, not everybody's business is exactly the same. You're in the healthcare business. You've got different expenses than Doug and I or, or CPAs, um, which is different than a construction worker. And so all of these are different. And so it's, you have to look at what's ordinary and necessary for your business. Um, not, not, you know, I, I love it all the time when people come in and tell me, well, Joe at the water cool, cooler told me I can do this. And I'm like, well, you're not in the same business. How can you do that? You know, so you got to be careful and, and, and please don't get your advice from Google and Facebook all the time. I mean, there are some good information out there, but there's also a lot of bad information out there. So, but yeah, we do provide that to whoever wants it. It's a, I, I try to update it every year because uh, there's changes to it, um, you know, because of the tax law changes. So that would be awesome. So for anyone watching, if you are interested, uh, please make sure to contact Cheryl at the chamber and she can make sure that she gets that to you. Thank you so much. Okay, so what taxable events impact your finances? What are your thoughts on that, Doug? Yeah, so really everything, right? Um, you know, how income is earned, you know, how expenses are paid, investments, business income, buying and selling a business, uh, real estate rentals, you know, all of these things come into play. And so, you know, any major event that happens, any, anything that's that's happening from a, from a profitability perspective from your business uh, or anything personally, any major events can certainly impact your finances and, and should be discussed with your CPA. Again, being proactive before the transaction or before the event. So sometimes we'll have, you know, and this is a great example. Now, I'm sure Scott can relate where, you know, we'll have a business owner who will sell a business and then, you know, let me know when it's time to prepare the taxes not understanding the implications of an asset sale versus a stock sale and, and how, you know, um, the, in fact, I've got one uh, right now that I'm working on where we've got to prepare an asset schedule because it, it makes a difference tax-wise as to what gets allocated at the purchase price to assets versus goodwill uh, or the, the real true um, yeah. value of the business. And so a lot of times, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And so I always say, talk to your CPA before any of those events so that you, you can be educated and make sure that you're not making a tax mistake uh, that's going to be too hard to un undo later. Very helpful. Go ahead, Scott. That's an excellent point, Doug, on the structuring. Um, I had a situation, it was years ago, where they sold, um, they sold their business, and I, I don't remember all the details, it was about 20 years ago. But they structured it so that it was all allocated to their uh, depreciable assets uh, of their equipment and et cetera. And then they did an installment sale. Well, you got to pay the piper on day one on that kind of sale. So it's super important to, to, to get that allocation done and how you're, gonna, how you're going to get paid. Because if you don't do it correctly, you end up paying your taxes without having any money to pay the taxes. So you've got to be very, very careful about that. And, and that's, you know, another good point on, on an asset sale versus a stock sale. And so many people, well, I just, you know, I'll just sell them my, my stock. And you got to be careful about that when, when you're buying something, because if you buy someone's stock, the other thing you got to plan for is you don't want to buy their problem. You end up with their tax, their tax bill. Um, one thing we hadn't mentioned that I wanted to uh, mention, I guess is a good time is 
One of the things that businesses have to be very, very careful of are payroll taxes. One of the biggest problems I see is people not paying their payroll taxes. And so if you're involved in a, in a buying or selling of a business, make sure that you're not buying their, their payroll tax problem. So, um, so that's, that's a good point on how, how you structure it. And, and the other thing, you know, in, in today's times, um, you know, Doug mentioned taxable, you know, every, you know, everything kind of impacts um, your finances and, you know, taxable income. Well, today it's kind of getting hard with these PP, you know, mentioned PPP loans and SBA deferments, et cetera, et cetera. What's taxable and what's not taxable in terms of these grants that people are getting. So you're going to have to be really careful and ask, well, is this grant I have going to be taxed at the end of the year? Is this the firm, you know, whatever you're getting, is this PPP loan? And like Doug said, it was, wasn't, was, wasn't. I mean, <laughs> the government could not make up their mind. But anyway, but those are those are important things to look at, you know, as to what some of your revenue right now, because of the way the government's handing out money or states are handing out money, you want to pay attention to what you do have to pay tax on and what may not be taxable. So that's something and, and and so for different states, um, you may have to do a little bit of research on some of these because um, they're not all treated exactly the same. So, um, and, and so like, like Doug said, a lot of things impact your finances. I mean, a lot of things you do. Uh, if you're planning to sell um, some property or stocks, you may want to think about, well, what's my capital, you know, do I have a capital gain on that? And if I do, what's the tax rate? Which of course depends on your individual income, but, but um, that's something that you want to look out ahead of time because I tell people all the time, make sure you set that money aside um, because a lot of people have a bad habit of, of getting money and then spending it and then realizing they have to pay the, pay the piper. So make sure you take that money and set it aside and know ahead of time what it is that, that you're going to have to have. So This is really bringing me back to my um, U of H days. Remember, I think it was accounting one and two, and I was like, "Woo!" <laughs> <laughs> Hearing all these terms, I was like, "Yeah, can I hurry up and get through this class?" <laughs> I could. I commend you who love the numbers, <laughs> love the accounting terms. Okay, so we're talking a lot about tax planning. So, how can we integrate tax planning into the financial planning? process. So we've kind of touched on that, but let's just kind of focus what's best practices of doing that. So integrating tax planning into the financial planning process. Yeah, I think I could probably start with that. And, and when we talk about financial planning, if we're talking about personal financial planning, you know, because that's what we're looking for a retirement, we're looking to make sure that we reach our goals, no matter what they are, it could be a vacation, it could be, uh, you know, uh, retirement early, it could be putting our kids through college, you know, whatever that happens to be, um, you know, having your, your financial planner, if you're working with a financial planner and your CPA in the same room, or at least having a conversation together is critical. You know, so many times as, as CPAs, we'll, we'll advise clients, and this was before we became registered investment advisors, we'll advise the client, hey, look, you might be able to save taxes as we're being proactive with our tax planning. If we do implement a retirement plan, go talk to your, your financial planner about this. And then the financial planner, you know, if the client does make it to the financial planner to have that conversation, tell us them to go talk to your CPA about the tax implications of what they're about to implement. And so if there's a disconnect between the two, then it, it could be uh, a pretty big tax bill by the time the time the process is done. So I think what's critical there is having both parties or both both parts of that equation, uh, at least at least together. That's an excellent point. Um, one of the things I do a lot is, um, I think you're a financial planner, right, Doug? Yes. You have both. I, I don't. I have enough licenses doing other things. I don't need another one. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I personally work with financial planners. Um, they, um, I'll call them for their client because their clients already said that I can. Um, and so we'll talk, uh, you know, about either the current situation or their, maybe what's, or what they can do in the future. And, and so I'll work with, with people's financial planner and making sure that we're all on the same page. And they'll call me too, to make sure, you know, if I do this, is, you know, they're gonna get this tax deduction or is this, you know, whatever that situation would be. Uh, you talked about kids in college. Well, there's ways to put money aside for that, you know, a 529 plan. 
There's so there's different things that you can do. And remember, most of these businesses we have here, they're flow through. So whatever it, whatever decisions you make on your on your business also impact your your personal uh, finances as well. So that's something that you want to um, uh, you know tie together. Uh, one thing is healthcare. If you're a, a, a subchapter S, your S corporation, and you want to, you know, if you have healthcare, you know, the healthcare for the owners is not going to be deductible through the business, although they can pay it. But if you know, it's either income or passes through to, to their personal tax return. So, so those are things that you have to look at um, on how you're going to do some of these things. Uh, whether you're going to purchase assets in the, you know, before January 1st, if you need them. Uh, the one thing I do warn people about on planning on this stuff, don't spend money if you don't need the items. Um, you know, you got to be smart with your money. You, and, and Doug knows this, he does financial planning. You got to be smart with your money. You got to figure out. And I've had people, well, I just want to buy something to have a tax deduction. And so it'll sit in your garage for a whole year. That doesn't make any sense. Remember, when you're doing these things, you only get a percent of the, everything you spend. So you, you wanna be smart on how you're going to spend that money and get the best tax deductions. And so you wanna then like, you know, the, we're talking about here is planning. We wanna do this before December 31. We wanna plan these things out, so. Yeah, great point, Scott. You know, when we talk about, you know, some of the planning items that I mentioned about equipment purchases, you know, cause under, you know, section 179, uh, you can deduct the entire amount of equipment up to over a million dollars in the year of purchase. Right. And so we'll tell clients very often, look, if you need equipment, go ahead and buy it, but don't spend a dollar to save 20 cents unless you need it, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. That makes sense, that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned, Scott, a little bit about the asset allocation and retirement planning. So that was our next topic. Did y'all wanna go any deeper as it pertains to asset allocation or retirement planning? Any well, ideas? I'll let Doug, he, he's a financial planner. It's, um, I'll let him talk <laughs> on that. Uh, like I said, I don't have a license in, in that. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I, you know, I won't go too deep here. We can, we can, we can spend the day talking about this subject, but I, you know, I think what's, what's most important from our perspective is diversification. You know, when you, when you look at retirement planning and you look at investing, you know, you want to be very diversified and that, that could be, you know, U.S. equities, small caps, large caps, foreign, domestic, you know, all, all of these things. If you build a portfolio out and you look at your plan, um, you know, that's what's most important. So many times we'll see clients come in and, and they're really rolling the dice. You know, when you equities or stock, the stock market is inherently risky. And so, you know, I believe in the stock market. I think the, the stock market uh, does very, very well over time and you can't really go wrong with it, but it's got to be diversified. So rather than saying, oh, you know what, uh, this Bitcoin company just went live or just went uh, public and I'm going to go ahead and put all my money in Bitcoin because I think it's going to be great it's really like going to the casino, you know, and, and that, that very, very well may pan out. But uh, we tell clients all the time, look, you know, for your nest egg, let's get that very diversified. Let's make sure that's protected. Let's, let's get to our goals with that money. And if you want to gamble with a little bit of money, that's okay. Let's carve it out and, and just, just, you know, buy those individual stocks that, that you're comfortable with losing that money as you would by going to the casino, but let's get diversified. And I think that's probably the biggest message I could, I could give on, on that topic. That's, yeah, that's, great, great that's, that's excellent. Um, you know, I know a lot of people ask me, you know, my opinion, I'm like, well, I don't do financial planning, but a lot of people will ask me about real estate, you know, adding that into their portfolio. And, and real estate can be really good, but I, I, I caution people, you know, they either want to flip houses or do rental real estate, those kinds of things. And I, I caution them, um, especially if you want to do rentals, you, you really have to have a stomach for, for that. And it gets to a risk factor. You know, we talked about, you know, diversifying. So you want to, you know, your, have your risk uh, as smooth as you can. And some people like to roll the dice more than others. But, um, and, but you also have to remember, you have to look at how old you are. You know, if you're 25 years old, I, don't, I, I know a lot of 25 year olds, they'll, they'll roll that dice on anything. You know, but if you're 60 years old, you, you better not be rolling too many, too many dice unless it's at a roulette table in Vegas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, so, no, that's that's a good diversification. And I just wanted to mention real estate because a lot of people ask me about that. But it's something that you really got to think about. I mean, it's a, it's a good way to make money, but um, you, you've got to be real careful with it and, and then make sure that you're paying attention to how you're doing that. So glad you brought that out. Real estate is not for everyone. No, <laughs> I was a, a landlord before I finally sold my house last year. I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> 
Yeah, some people just don't have the stomach for it. And I, I get it. I, I do have rent property, but um, I don't mind throwing them out. But other people, it, it's just not for them. So you've got to understand what you can uh, tolerate. I, I will say this, uh, you know, I, I'm in a rental game, um, but, you know, I'm in a rental uh, business for my own businesses. And so I'm the tenant. And so, you know, that that is a good a good plan, I think, long term is if you are spending a lot of money on rent and you can buy the building that you're occupying or the, the condo that you're occupying, you know, that's something to consider. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, um, you know, we recently uh, purchased a firm that that had been in, in business for a long time and, and paid paid rent for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, at the end of the 30 years, there's really nothing to show for that that rent. Yeah. And so certainly they could have paid a building off in that same amount of time. So, um, you know, but, but you know, you got to have a good tenant. And I think I'm my own good tenant. So <laughs> that, that is an excellent point, Doug. Um, a lot of people come and they want to you know, buy a building or whatever. But the one thing I wanted to mention on that, and this is probably how you, you've done yours, is you want to separate your real estate business from your operating business. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that way, um, you, you don't, from a legal liability, there's, there's issues there. So you, you really want to separate that. But that's an excellent point. Um, you know, if you can afford and you know, go out and, and get your own building and set yourself up as your own tenant, that's, that's an excellent. And from a tax standpoint, it's, it's a way to shift uh, a, your, your income. Uh, for self-employment purposes, so um, the, the self-employment tax purposes. So, but that's that's an excellent point. Awesome, very good points, gentlemen. So we're coming towards an end. We have a couple of more questions, and this has been a very thorough and good discussion. So our last one is any not our last one, but next to last, any tax considerations as it pertains to legacy planning. You know, I, I think the most important thing here is to pay attention to what's happening uh, with the administration. You know, there's going to be some some tax reform coming, you know, uh, certainly with legacy planning, you're worried about estate taxes. And right now, the, you know, estate tax limit is, is set at 11.2 million, I believe it is, uh, per person. And so that's that's uh, slated to cut in half, you know, under the, the normal rules, you know, it's set the sunset, if that makes sense, set the sunset, yeah. It's going to sunset, which means it goes back to uh, the pre-Trump uh, era uh, of going down to, I think, 5 million. And, you know, the proposal with, with President Biden, you know, may reduce that amount. Uh, capital gains may go to, to go away and go to ordinary tax rates. And so, you know, all of this stuff comes into, into play uh, when you're looking at uh, legacy planning. And you're also looking at, you know, uh, business transactions. So, so whether we should sell a business today versus to, uh, next year, you know, that, that could have a huge impact uh, you know, tax wise, uh, because maybe this year we're under capital gains, maybe next year it's ordinary income, which could be significant. The, the, ta the top tax rate for, uh, for capital gains is 20%. There's a net investment tax that could be added onto it. Uh, but the top, top ordinary income tax rate is 37%. And that is due to go up to 39% under the Biden plan. So, you know, those decisions uh, are critical to, you know, uh, your personal wealth you know, uh, as you receive that money, then, uh, of course, uh, to, um, to legacy planning. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, right now it's, you know, 11, almost 11 and a half million dollars. And if it goes back down, it was like, I think about five and a half, something like that. I can remember the exact number, but it's real important. And it's important for people, um, from an estate planning side, also from, from, um, having your will uh, properly drafted for that because that does impact how you might pay or not pay taxes um, if, if you, uh, in your estate. Um, but you're right, I mean, the, these tax changes, um, this is something you really need to pay attention to because it can really matter. And 2025, he's talking about sunsetting, this, it happens in 2025. And so everything kind of reverts back. And uh, a lot of people forget that when, uh, under the Clinton administration, it was, um, six hundred thousand dollars went to six sixty, and then it went up to a million um, at the end. Um, and so anything over that, if you have these at types of assets, you're going to pay tax on them when you pass away. Unfortunately, um, so you really need to plan for that. Also, the other thing that's happening, we we talked about IRAs. Um, make sure you understand how things get passed on too, because uh, you know that that law changed last year. 
um, to where it uh, actually goes back to an old law where you used to have to take out an IRA over five years now, and they changed that to where it's it's um, over the life of somebody. Now it's back to 10 years. So you've got to really pay attention to, to how IRAs are done and then how you pass them on. A lot of people want to either put them into a trust or do something with them. You got to be real careful about that and make sure you talk to somebody on on how you how you want things to get passed on um, to your children. Um, so. Thank you. Very, very proactive um, planning when it comes to that and something I don't think a lot of people think about, but really need to give some consideration. OK, we're coming down to our last question. So just if you want to add your tidbits, we've talked about a lot today, but just overall tips to be proactive throughout the year. And I'll turn it over to Scott. Well, um, and we're talking about making sure that we get our taxes uh, paid and don't get hit with penalties. Um, some of the things you may want to make sure that you have is you have your uh, withholding proper. If you if you have like an S corporation, you're taking a salary, make sure you're paying enough in. If you're uh, self-employed and you have a Schedule C or maybe a partnership, remember your tax rate can be, you know, it can be 37, it can be 41%. A lot of people get shocked when I tell them how much they're going to owe or what their rates are, but you have to factor in your self-employment uh, portion of that. So make sure that you are paying in enough and so that at the end of the year, you don't, uh, you, you don't get hit with a, a tax bill that you're not expecting. And do things during the year to, to help adjust with that a retirement planning, uh, IRA, uh, a SEP plan or um, a simple plan or a 401k, something like that. Have, have that, make sure you contribute to some kind of plan. And, you know, and anything we talk about, if you do it during the year, it's a lot easier to pay $100 a month versus $1,000 at the end of the year or some, you know, some big number. So, so make sure that you do things during the year. Um, also look at, um, uh, I know Doug had talked about um, uh, tax loss harvesting. If you have capital losses, and you have capital gains, you may want, want to take advantage of that. So do you have other things to add, Doug? No, I think you, you, you hit on all the key points there, Scott. So I, only thing I would say is, you know, uh, if your books aren't up to date, you know, your, your, your financial statements, um, that's, that's the number one thing that you should, you should do uh, as soon as you leave this conference is go, go focus on getting your books up to date because your, your accountant can't help you if they don't know what your, what your this year's tax liability is looking like. So um, and then secondly, go ahead and set up an appointment uh, to, you know, once we get through this tax deadline to start looking at, uh, you know, 2021 uh, to see what that looks like and see if you can't be uh, proactive and, and, you know, minimizing your tax situation moving forward. Awesome. That sounds good. And so again, we want to thank you, gentlemen, Scott and Doug for joining us today and, and giving us that information and advice and expertise. Again, for anyone watching um, live or that will join us later, you can check the comments. If you want to get in contact with Scott or Doug, their information is listed. Also, Scott has agreed to provide a documentation on deductions. And so you can get that from Cheryl at the chamber if you're interested in getting that document as well. We do want to do kind of a review for next month's meeting. Next month's meeting is going to be on the topic of branding and public relations. So we are going to interview a panel. That should be really good. A panel of uh, publicists and those who specialize on branding. And just want to reiterate some of the other topics we have coming up for this year. We're going to be talking about human resources, compliance, training, and development recruiting. So we know that's a hot topic this year because um, a lot of industries are having a hard time finding people to work, surprisingly. So we're going to talk about some assessment tools and motivators. Also, understanding the difference in sales and marketing. So a lot of people kind of put them together, but we're going to talk about what they are, what the differences are, and why you really need to encompass both of those as it pertains to business. We're going to talk about the business owner, employee health and wellness, and why that's so important. If you want to stay in business, you need to focus on your own health and wellness. We're going to talk about finance, wealth development, both from a business perspective and a personal. 
And then we're going to touch on philanthropy and community impact and how that should be encompassed into your business. And then in December, we'll talk about business planning, success in numbers. We're going to measure some KPIs and budgeting and really talk about how we can get ourselves prepared for 2022. So we want to thank everybody for joining and we want to encourage you guys to join us next month. We meet on the third Friday of each month. So that will be the May 21st at 10 a.m. Everyone have a good day. Me too. Thank, Thank you. you.